Hello, Smart Money Tree Podcast listeners. Welcome to this week's show. My name is Kirk Chisholm, and I will be your host. So today, I'm joined with Brian Kaderna. How are you doing today, Brian? Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on the show. So, uh, Brian, why don't you tell us a bit about your background? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, in short, I'm a financial advisor. Um, I've been doing this since 2008. It's a job I got into right out of college. And um, really like the entrepreneurial spirit of it. So I uh, built up my own private practice, um, focused mostly in the medical space. And about half my line of business is insurance and about half is assets under management. Um, so license in insurance and investing, that's what I do. And uh, that's me in a nutshell professionally. And then I have you know my podcast and my books and lots of other ventures that I enjoy doing that are kind of ancillary to my wealth management business. So what what kind of brought you into wealth management? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's funny if we kind of rewind the clock, like when I was in college, you know, I, I first started at the University of Tampa and I was a marketing major. Um, then eventually I transferred to the college in New Jersey. And when I got there, you know, I, and this is kind of a little sidebar, but I ended up having uh, an interview with the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency. And I'll never forget the guy I'm interviewing with says, you know, do you speak another language and not Spanish? And I was like, oh, no. And then he goes, do you have a pilot's license? And I was like, no, like, where are we going? And he's like, all right. And uh, he's like, then this is going to be tough. And long story short, he says, you know what? We need practical skills. Everything we do is following the money. You know, we follow the money where the bad guys go. And that's how we solve our cases. So he said, if you're going to be in business, we need you to have a finance degree or an accounting degree. And I knew I didn't want to do accounting. I always liked finance. I liked my investment courses. So I went right to the registrar's office and I changed my major from marketing to finance. And then shortly thereafter, I got an internship at a wealth management firm. And that's what ultimately launched kind of uh, this whole idea and what I took on as a career right after I graduated. Nice. Well, that's uh, it's funny. That's the second uh, guest we've had on the show who's given a similar story of uh, he was more on the tax side and he was trying to get the DEA was trying to rope him into uh, working really? with them. And he's like, he's like, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I don't want to be your scapegoat here. <laughs> like, I know where this <laughs> is going and you're not going to put me in a room with these these uh, dangerous people. That's not the line of work I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was something that intrigued me. I mean, I was it, going out of high school, like I really thought I would want to get into law enforcement or the government. And um, it's funny, like in just those four short years of college, as you start to kind of change your mind, pursue different leads, and all of a sudden you kind of find what fits. And that's how I ended up, you know, getting to, and I like to wear a lot of different hats, you know, so I could be the financial advisor. Um, but I have lots of other things, like I've mentioned that, uh, you know, it's kind of like every day is a little different. And that's really what suits me. Yeah, so let's let's dive in and talk about some of the topics that you you enjoy talking about, because, you know, obviously, the the economy um, is is in an interesting place. And I, I find that we have a wide range of opinions about how things are, where they're going to go. Um, you know, you, you, you talked about some of the, uh, some of the things prior to the show that you want to talk about, but ultimately, um, you know, we have a lot of dynamics going on. So maybe you could talk about some of them. Maybe we want to start with, uh, you know, the debt bubble going on. Cause that's a, that's a big problem, but it doesn't seem to be a problem for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I, I know the one that's been front and center that we're all getting well-educated on now in the past couple of years has been inflation. And I think if you speak with most economists, most folks in the know, they'll say the inflation really came about because of just the, in, the insane amount of spending that we were doing following COVID or even amid COVID with the stimulus packages, you know, dropping interest rates to rock bottom, quantitative easing. I mean, just absolutely flooding our economy with money. Uh, and that's on top of, you know, the enhanced unemployments and all the other things we were doing at that time. Um, so it's kind of like in the near term, I think the immediate symptom was inflation. You know, it, it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't like they passed the bill and we said, oh, the CPI just went through the roof. Obviously, all that money has to start to work its way into the economy, which it did. And then that's where we saw in, you know, 2021 at the end, you know, the CPI really start to climb. 
And if you remember, you know, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell famously said, oh, this is just going to be transient as if it's passing through. And, you know, a lot of people gave him a hard time for that, rightfully so. Uh, but that was just because of so much spending, so much easy money. And now, with you know, they he's kind of done a 180 and really declared war on on inflation, you know, extremely aggressive rate hikes that we saw last year which most of us haven't really witnessed, uh, you know, you know, so many young professionals out there never really knew what that was like in the seventies or eighties to kind of live through that, um, that level of inflation and high interest rates. So that that's kind of what's happening in the here and now, but I think like you alluded to with the debt bubble, um, you know, it, it's just pumping up this thing. That's a number that's in the background you know, when you say numbers like 33 and $34 trillion of debt, it's hard to even wrap your head around. And, and when you get to such gigantic numbers like that, when it goes to 35 trillion, no one even bats an eye. And so I think that's the thing that worries me when we talk about long term economics. And it's not in my opinion, it's not really getting enough attention. And it, it doesn't cause short term catastrophe. Um, but it is something that, you know, like when we just saw, you know, our, our U.S. debt get downgraded, that's a big deal. And one of the real reasons it got downgraded is because they pointed to just this debt that seems to be out of control that you can manage in the near term, but long term that starts to have an effect. Yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's funny. You, you, you make a great point and how the amount of debt is so big that people can't conceive it. Mm -hmm. You know, who is it who said, uh, I forget who it was, it was maybe, um, it was maybe one of the, the Nazis that said, uh, Stalin, Stalin, yeah, it was Stalin. Yeah. It was yeah. one of, one, one of those, uh, one of those, uh, horrible the people. Guys. Yeah. Who's, <laughs> who basically said, yes, uh, one, one death is a tragedy, is a tragedy. A, a large amount of deaths is a statistic. Of course I'm paraphrasing and yeah. you know, it, and the, and the point of what he was saying was that as you get, as the numbers get larger, they're not easy to conceive, right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, what is 32, 33 trillion dollars? I don't know. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. It's you know, impossible to fathom. Yeah, it's, it's like crazy. it's like 30, that, that'd be what, 33 apples, apple companies? I mean, it's <laughs> you know, if if you think about it, it's it's really uh, such a large number that that uh, you know, I mean, with inflation, it certainly makes things a little bit more challenging to um to keep up with with numbers, but so where do you, you know i look at a country like japan which is like three or four hundred percent debt to gdp the u.s is somewhere around 120 i think mm -hmm. um you know what does it really matter I, I mean this is a question and and i'm on the same page as you but like does debt really yeah. matter like governments don't seem to care it doesn't seem to matter in, in many shape or form so I, th I think it does matter for sure. Um, you know, can it be offset? The answer, you know, is yes. Yeah, we if we have debt that keeps growing, and we say, Oh, my gosh, 33 trillion. Um, that's a scary number. But then if you look at the GDP, and you look at the growth of the economy, if that outpaces it, then it's kind of like, who cares? You know, who cares if my mortgage is a little bigger, if my home is worth three times more than, you know, the home I bought 10 years ago. So it, everything is relative. Um, so that is true. And, and I think that's oftentimes the argument for people that say, ah, you know what, don't don't worry so much about it. Um, but I think, you know, if we look at ratios and we say, OK, well, let's take the relative stance of evaluating it. If we go back and we look at the history of our country and that debt to GDP ratio, it has never been so out of whack compared to where we are right now. So it's. It's hard if we saw that that was the case over the past 60 years, then we could say, OK, you know what? This is par for the course. Like, yeah, the number's getting bigger, but our economy is booming. It's in check. But when you look at debt to GDP and how out of whack it is now versus 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I think that's where you can say, OK, maybe we should zone in on this. Maybe it's a little bit more of a, a kind of an alarm here. Um so that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the point that I, I really want to drive home to people. And the thing that even if we go back to like Reaganomics, and then what's kind of happened since then, is you've seen more on the side of tax cutting, uh, which I like, I think it's good. I think that that really helps the economy. But you've also seen a lot more on government spending. So it's kind of like, 
you know, like what Reagan was famous for was his tax cuts, but he wasn't famous for making a smaller government. And when you have that kind of move in that trajectory where it's like, all right, let's lower the taxes, but let's create more entitlements, more support, larger government, all these things, all of that just points to debt and to more debt. And it's a, a really tall order for the economy because then I think you're asking the economy to, to really um, just take off. And which fortunately for a lot of the past you know 30 years it has, um, but I, I think, you know, when you deal with that amount of leverage, it starts to get a little dicey. Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. It's it's one that I come back to a lot, which is, you know, does debt matter? And and if it does, how? You know, I mean, the government has basically been printing money for 20 years, but now it's destroying money, right? It's shrinking the money supply and it's raising interest rates. The, the big question I have is, you know, the dynamics have changed. Why haven't the markets kind of woken up? You know, like it's what they're doing should cause the markets to go down. I mean, historically, that that is true, but yet uh, they're not at the moment anyway, as of the taping of the show. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I guess it's a, the question is, you know, what is actually r the underlying uh, dynamics running the markets nowadays? Because a lot of things yeah. have changed over the last 20 years, and I don't think a lot of people have caught up to speed with it. Yep. So I, I guess I might answer that question maybe in two ways. Um, one thing I often explain to people is that the markets really are like a measure of liquidity. Um, so the, the more money that's in our economy, the more money that's flowing through the system, you know, it's kind of like this exponential growth effect. And that gets reflected through the markets. So when the Fed has really low interest rates, as they did for a, a long time there, when they're doing the quantitative easing. So when they're flooding the economy with cash, that gets reflected in the markets. You know, people are spending more, people are able to borrow more and cheaper. And so there's just more going into the economy, whether it's real estate, investing, and, and then businesses, you know, growing and capital expenditures and all this stuff um, that makes the market expand. That's the direct reflection. And so when, uh, on the flip side, when the Fed says, okay, we want to shrink the money supply, we actually want to slow the economy down, which is what they started doing in 21 and really in 22 um, with all the, the rate hikes. That's when you immediately see that reflection in the market. And, and, you know, the market goes down, you know, 20% like it did. So now I think right now we're in a period this year where it's like, all right, the economy was really strong. And we've kind of, we took it on the chin with those rate hikes. And so I think that's why we've had a positive year thus far is that all the negativity, you know, was kind of baked into um, the immediate reflection that the markets gave us last year in 22. Uh, so that's one thing I think is just like, you can't fight the Fed. You know, if, if they have a large money supply, the markets are going to continue to kind of get frothy um, when it shrinks a lot, then we see it go down like it did last year. And then, so you have the Fed is one element. And then another thing, obviously, is, is governance, which we're not seeing a lot, I don't think, right now in, in politics. We haven't seen like huge, um, you know, expansion of the tax code uh, right now. That obviously would be a negative, but a lot of that's kind of been put on the back burner. Um, so that has been helpful to the market through all this. And then the third one, kind of the X factor is tech. And so I talk a lot about this, like in my book as well, that you know, big tech is just like a shot in the arm for the whole economy. And if you look at what these companies have done, it's just tremendous. And, uh, you know, the NASDAQ, which used to be kind of like a part of the S&P 500. Now you look at, you know, these tech stocks, they make up the bulk of the S&P 500 just because they're so enormous. And uh, I think that's just been a beautiful thing for the economy. Yeah, it, it does raise some some hard questions, though, when you have uh, the, the seven big, big tech stocks up 54 percent this year and the whole uh, S&P 500 without those is up four um, percent. Mm -hmm. And, exactly. you know, it, you know, AI, whatever you want to call. I mean, I think AI is a little bit early uh, or too early to celebrate, but, you know, market investors don't. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I, I guess it it, it kind of raises the question so that you're so you're kind of reiterating some of the things we talk about in the show, like the fundamentals of the economy have changed. 
Um, mm -hmm. But yet the markets are still high. So it seems like tech is 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 kind of uh, pushing all of the markets. So really, the question is, is what is going to cause things to change? Right. Because yep. the dynamics have changed and like significant dynamics like liquidity, interest rates, and yet the markets don't seem to care. Yeah. And so I think when you say what what would cause it to change, I would look back at those three things that have caused it to change in a positive sense. I think those would be the three biggest influencers that can maybe again turn it into a negative sense. You have the Fed, where if they say, you know what, we're really serious about inflation and we don't ever want to maybe go down this road again. So if they say we're going to keep rates higher for longer and they decide that they don't want to cut rates at the end of this year or even in 2024, that's not very good news for the markets. So that's where we could see maybe a slight correction. I don't think anything crazy, but that could be something. Then you have, you know, like we said, you know, politics and governance, which has kind of been on the sidelines. If, you know, the Biden administration before he's out of, out of office says, you know what, I promised we're going to go after the rich, you know, we're going to start taxing and, and if they can get something through uh, or a lot more business regulation, things like that, that could be a, a shock to the economy um, that would get reflected in the markets. We haven't seen that. And then kind of a, a combination of all of that, what we're seeing right now in the tech sector is, you know, some of the, the antitrust stuff going on about trying to go after big tech. And, you know, is Google right now a monopoly with how much money they're paying to be the primary search engine and, um, you know, the default search engine for so many? So I think if you start to see a lot more of that government regulation going after tech, breaking up some of these behemoths, that would slow tech, which, again, is such a big part of the markets. Um, I think those are the three things you could maybe keep an eye on and say, all right, if those come to surface that may not be very good news for the stock market. Yeah, I guess it's uh, to be determined, right? It's uh, markets True. are rational longer than, than most people can remain solvent, as they say. Um, yeah. So let's talk about some of the other things that, that, you, that we talked about. So things like entitlements, which, um, you know, based on our numbers, and I try not to scare too many people on the show, but, you know, the early to mid 30s is when Medicare, Social Security and um, pensions all run out of money at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. Huge problem that virtually nobody's talking about in the news, which isn't a surprise because the yeah. news isn't really news. Um, but let's talk about like entitlement spending, because, you know, ultimately, if economically things aren't getting better, uh, outside mm -hmm. of big tech and government, which is taking up whatever 40% of the spending is going to keep increasing. Uh, yep. What what does the, um, how, how does that work? How does that look in the next 10 years? Because if you have to cut entitlements, that's a big problem. Yeah, so I think what you're going to see, and unfortunately this has been kind of the, the game plan for a lot of recent memory is just kind of kicking the can down the road. Uh, I, I would I hypothesize that that's what we're going to see. You know, no politician wants to touch these issues because they know it's like taboo. You know, it's it's interesting right now. It's like they're stuck between a rock and a hard place where do they confront Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security head on and at the risk of, you know, jeopardizing the senior citizen vote, you know, which is a huge swath of voters that they could scare to death if they say, you know, these things really need to get changed immediately. And then on the flip side, you know, you've got millennials and then Gen Z coming up saying, we don't even care about that stuff. We don't even know if it's going to be there. All we're concerned about are these student loans that we're drowning in. And so it's like the politicians there saying like, well, we got to appeal to somebody. That's what they're all doing is fighting for votes with the, the limited time that they have to you know, politic and, and serve their term. So, you know, it's a kind of a roundabout answer to it's things that need to be addressed, but politically it's not favorable to address it. And I think that's why they keep kicking the can. So with that said, and this goes back to the debt question that we started with, the three you mentioned, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, those are huge drivers to our debt. They're the bedrock of our entitlement system. And we all know that they need to get fixed. Nobody wants to do it. So I think what people will likely see is as we get nearer to that kind of end date in the 2030s, 
um, you know, we'll just continue to take on more debt. And then uh, really what needs to happen is social security, the retirement age needs to get postponed. You know, people are living way longer today than they did in 1945 when we started this thing. So it's like, we got to keep up with the times and you'll probably see some window dressing uh, that can not fool voters, but at least make it more palatable where perhaps we say, okay, you know, we'll not go up as fast as inflation, or maybe we'll tax social security benefits a little bit harder, or we'll make it a little bit more difficult to qualify for Medicaid um, or Medicare reimbursements will go down a little bit and they'll stop paying, you know, the, the health providers as much. So you'll see different little kind of things going on there where they're lessening the benefits, but without saying, hey, we're cutting your check. Um, so I think you'll see different things like that that will kind of be like window dressing as they continue to kick the can. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. So yeah. l- let me let me ask you this, because one of the things that is not traditionally an entitlement, but seems to be becoming one is a student loan debt problems. And mm-hmm. You know, I get the feeling that the dynamics of this country are changing, right? It's it's we're a capitalist country, but it seems like people are with all the entitlements, with all the you know, I I want my share kind of thing. People people uh, are more apt to chase maybe other methodologies that are not capitalist based because they feel like things are not fair. So mm-hmm. how is that affecting you know the economy or things going forward? Do you think? Yeah, so it's um, I mean, the student loans, it it has become a bit of a pandemic um, in itself. And uh, it's another one that sh- desperately needs to be addressed. And one of my big fears is, again, what's politically, in a lot of ways, it's seen as like politically favorable is to pursue these different forgiveness programs. Um, you know, think about it, we had, I guess it was March of 2020, is when they froze both accruing interest and repayments on federal student loans, uh, which I think at that time was pushing like $2 trillion of outstanding debt. All right, that's owed to the government. That would be a huge assistance to the government when they have you know $33 trillion of debt outstanding. Um, so we know that that debt needs to be paid. March of 2020, we say, hey, COVID happened. This was to no fault of your own, shock the economy. Um, you know, shut the doors. So we're going to help you out here. That is still going as we speak. All right. Nobody is making a federal student loan repayment that they have to make until October 1st. So here we are in September of 2023. So literally three and a half years later, and we're still providing quote unquote COVID relief to graduates of college that are out there working And it's things like that, that it's like, what are you doing? Like, what's, what's really the point of that? You know, do we really need right now in September of 23 COVID relief for those folks? I don't think most people would agree with that, but we certainly like it. If somebody has a large federal debt that they're repaying, they're loving it. My interest ain't accruing and I don't have to pay this bill. I'm, I'm able to go rent or go use my money elsewhere. Um, so I think things like that. And then with the recent, you know, what what Biden was trying to do with the 10 and $20,000 forgiveness, when you do those things, when you get a 23 year old, they're like, all right, great. You know, I'm, I'm happy. Thank you. You're going to get my vote. But when you look at the big picture and you look at these enormous educational systems and colleges and universities that are the construction sites to the nth degree, that money is coming, you know, by way of debt. And I think when then the government says, okay, we issued so much debt that it can't even be repaid. So we're going to forgive it. It's kind of like giving another blank check in essence to these systems to say, okay, you know, you're charging your kids $70,000 of tuition annually, you can up it to 80,000. And and we know that that bill is going to get paid by the government. Um, I just think that creates a moral hazard where now the colleges don't have to view themselves so stringently as an entrepreneur or as a business, um, knowing that they have so much incredible support. And the pendulum will swing. I, I think it is swinging a little right now. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, that's a, a big deal, again, to the government. And then also to these young people that are trying to get started that, uh, you know, I don't think they should be going to school, uh, undergrad for four years, 
coming out, you know, with $150,000 of debt. I mean, that's tough. Yeah, wages have gone up, but they haven't gone up that quickly to keep up with like that type of debt as a 22 year old. Yeah, it's it's really hard to to get out of that kind of debt with, um, you know, coming out of college and you're not, you know, not making nearly enough. And then real estate's out of out of range for most people now because the real estate prices haven't come down. So starter homes are out of range like mm -hmm. the, the boomer generation has really blown things out of out of proportion <laughs> for the everybody else is feeling the hurt because of them. And uh, a little bit blame. So. Don't want to blame the boomers, but when you're 80 something years old, you should, probably should be retiring from Congress and the presidency and all that. So, mm -hmm. but somehow the boomers still want to retain power, and that's uh, unfortunate. But um, so yeah, there needs to be balance. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, it does bring up some interesting dynamics about the student loans because um, you know one of the panelists on our show is an expert in student loans and. And, you know, the funny thing is, is it's just the government allows them to raise their, their prices every year. As you said, the colleges have become businesses and uh, they just keep growing for the nature of growing. And not to say that they're not providing good education, but when you have a negative ROI, when you get out of college, it's not exactly uh, a good starting point for your life. So mm -hmm. what can people do to um, improve their situation? Because the world is what it is. We can't change it. So what can we do to improve our own personal situation so that we don't put ourselves into a position where things are, um, let's say, less than favorable? Yeah, sure. So I think if we want to start, you know, if we have the benefit of time, like let's say we're, we're talking to a kid that's about to go to college and begin their financial impact on the world. Um, I, first and foremost, I, I strongly encourage, and I do this with clients all the time, that they really understand what's the value of that education. You know, what is that their child going to college for? What do they want to major in? How much is it going to cost? You know, the full boat, the tuition, the room, the board, with the financial aid, any lending or any scholarships, really understand the cost. And then go, you can go right online and check out, you know, what are jobs paying today? What's the average salary in New Jersey, New York, or in America? to be a you know marketing manager to be a dentist to be a software engineer you know and understand okay i'm going to go make this investment in myself and my education with my family with some leverage likely and then i'm going to graduate probably with some debt what's that number going to be and then what do i think i'm going to earn 4 years from today when i sign my first employment agreement I think that's step number one. If we totally ignore that and just say, hey, I'm going to a college. I love this place. The campus was sick. I think I want to study this. I'm not sure. That's the start of conversations I see. And I'm like, oh boy, like in four years, it's a crapshoot if this is going to be good or bad. And that can put people really behind the eight ball when they enter the real world. Now, when they get out there, you know, I think the biggest thing that I often encourage, one, get a job fast, no doubt about that. And this is the gig economy. So if you're a little bit worried of, hey, you know, I, I got a starting job, I'm 23 years old, but I also have a little debt over here. That's fine. Go ahead and start Ubering, you know, start, you know, waiting on the weekend, start, you know, doing these different things, lifeguarding in the summer while you teach during the year, you know, things like that, where, you know, you, there's nothing saying you need to just follow this one kind of like little career in a box, you now have so much opportunity out there to kind of make ends meet. And then that's where I start to get into my financial planning process, which um, the sooner we get there, the better we are. If we start that at 23, awesome. If we wait till we're 33, we just got a, a late start and we got to play catch up. If we start when we're 43, like this is the real world. Now we're starting to have an impact on how am I going to retire one day? Uh, so I think, you know, timing has a lot to do with it all. Yeah, no, totally agree. Well, appreciate your insights here. Um, as we, as we kind of wrap it up, any, any kind of fun, let, let's talk about this uh, before we wrap it up, actually, is you have a, a process. I want to talk about your process that you work with people because it's, uh, it's interesting. It brings in some different dynamics than I think most. So what, what is your, tell us a little bit about your process. Yeah. So my financial planning process in short is a, a five-step process. Um, and the way that that goes is protection first. All right. So that's the first thing with all my clients, whether they're 22 years old 
or they're 60 years old and have millions and millions of dollars, it's protection first. And so that's where we're talking about time sensitive, health sensitive things like life and disability insurance, um, later on a long term care insurance, and then also everything on the liability side, you know, what if everything in life is going perfect, and then you have a split second accident, and you get sued, and, and all your wealth now is exposed, you know, when you thought life was going perfect. So all those threats to a plan, that's the first thing we want to do is kind of put them in a bubble where we can protect them. The second thing is going to be liquidity. So we talk about what's the right amount of emergency funds? How do you actually develop a budget and be realistic so you understand your inflows and outflows and that cash is king, you need a buffer. So it's protection first, build liquidity. Then step three is organizing your debt. All right, if we have high interest debt, especially credit cards, that can be like poison to a plan. That's where we really need to spend time there and rein that in and make sure that that's getting attention and we have a strategy there. And then the fourth step is getting into wealth accumulation. So when we know we got that good foundation of protection, liquidity, and toxic debts are eradicated, then we start to get into how do we make your money grow? Where do we want to invest? Looking at different accounts. Is it for college? Is it Roth IRAs? Is it your 401k with the match, et cetera? And then the final and fifth step, which usually gets the most attention, even though it should be kind of that last leg, is investing. And how do we actually maximize all that you have? Uh, so I love that conversation. It is a fun conversation. It's where our money makes money. But if we ignore the first four steps of that, we don't have any financial plan. We're just throwing money out there. So I think that five-step process, that's what I really try to guide my clients through. Okay, cool. Well, let's uh, give us give us your kind of final thoughts here before we wrap up. Anything you wanted to mention before we before we uh, head out here? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's all based on how you look at things. You could be an optimist or a pessimist. You could say we're going into a recession, the world's collapsing, the debt's insane, or you could just look at this endless opportunity that's out there that you could take advantage of. So that's what I really try and uh, I, I like to see the optimistic side of things. And um, I know we didn't really speak much on, on my new book, which is called What Should I Do With My Money? Um, but all these things that we're addressing today, we can get into a lot of detail, a lot of research in the book and also make it relatable and readable. So um, I hope people will kind of check that out and, uh, you know, find it beneficial. Awesome. Well, Brian, really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, where can people find more about you? Yep. So they could find me at briancaderna.com. Uh, that's my website on all my socials. Just if you search Kaderna or be Kaderna, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you'll find me there. Um, my podcast, the Kaderna podcast is available everywhere and on YouTube. And then, like I said, my book, What Should I Do With My Money is available wherever books are sold. If you want to know more about me and kind of my thinking and economic literacy, I poured my heart and soul into that. It's all there in that book. So definitely check it out. Awesome. All right. Well, Brian, really appreciate you coming to the show. Uh, we'll have you back on the future here. All right. Thanks, Kirk. Hey, Doug, did you hear? We're giving away free money. Well, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But before I do, there's a saying in the mining community, well, precious metals mining, that is. The saying is that if you want the best deals, you have to be in the room. Now, you're probably thinking, what does it mean to be in the room? Well, I'll tell you. Being in the room means that you're on the short list of people who get invited to be a part of the best deals. These are the deals that most investors will never have access to. You mean like IPOs? Nope, IPOs are chump change. Those are for retail investors, small potatoes. That's nothing compared to these deals. These deals would have you salivating to get access to them. Once you know they exist, you will never look at investing the same way again. I almost don't want to even tell you that they exist because it will ruin your thinking of how the investing world really works. Now, you might be excited that these deals exist, but you only have access to the deals if you're an insider or in the room, as they call it. Now, as loyal listeners to the show, I'm going to give you a chance to be in the room. Money Tree Investing Podcast has created the Insiders Club. This is a community of our show's members who are loyal listeners of the show and want to get more out of their investing experience. Being a part of the Insiders Club gives you insider status for upcoming events and webinars, discounts, free stuff and books, 
and influence on the future direction of the show. This is a great opportunity to join us as we expand our content and services. Oh, and did I mention free money? Yes, in the next few weeks, I'll be giving away free money to our members of the Insiders Club as my appreciation for listening to the show. Now, there's no cost to join the Insiders Club. Just go to moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money today to join the community. That's www.moneytreepodcast.com forward slash free money. I hope to see you in the room. All right, that was a great interview with Brian. Really appreciate him coming to the show. Now we're getting into the panel portion of the show where we have our very own Phil Weiss. Hey, Phil. Hey, Kirk. How are you today? Doing great. Doing great. And we also have our very own Barb Freeberg. Hey, Barb. Hi, Kirk. Hi, Phil. Happy to be here. Glad to have you both. So let's just dive right in. So, Phil, what were some of your takeaways from the interview? So I, I like the five steps that he had in his his process, and especially the fact that he doesn't start with investing because there's so many things that we have to figure out before we even get to investing. I know when I work with clients, I do life planning and I do the life plan before we even get to the investing because there's a few reasons for that. One, you have to know what it is that that money's for, right? There's a lot of times people think about just building a pile of money, but they don't think about what it's for. So you have to know what it's for because that helps to inform how you want to invest that money, how much risk you want to take, what you need. So you have to understand a lot of those other things, you know, he talked about being able to protect yourself. That's important, right? Too. You want to make sure that um, you've looked at the different aspects of your life and your plan before you get to the investing. I always tell people like an asset allocation, it's based upon your risk tolerance. It's also based upon your plan. We want to kind of marry all those things together. And we don't know all those things till we get to the end of the process. So it's really hard to do investing up front. It's really better to wait till the end. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So, Barb, what about you? What are some of your takeaways? The most important thing today in your financial picture, your total financial picture, is that you are balanced, that you have some money that's there that is not in the investment markets. And be it cash, cash equivalent, short-term bonds, that you can use this money that is relatively liquid when, like myself, you need to replace your air conditioner, your hot water heater at the same time. You also might need this money if your job is somewhat unstable and you're, you want to be prepared should you or your spouse lose their job. So I really want to focus on the cash part and the short-term debt part of what should be a portion of most people's investments and how to maximize that money. Yeah, I think the cash is an understated thing that that certainly most people kind of overlook. They just think, oh, it'll be it'll be fine. Um, so, Phil, you know, looking at, at Brian's process, you know, the protection, liquidity, organizing debt, wealth accumulation, investing, um, you know, when you look at that, like, how do you, when you're working with clients, like how do you do their financial planning? Do you do that first, the investing? Like how does that, how does how does your process work in comparison? Or maybe it's the same, like just just for context. So my process, I said I do life planning. So there's a process that I follow, the life planning process. The acronym for that is Evoke. So first we have an exploration meeting. And the purpose of that meeting is really to help me understand and, and you understand what is your most fulfilled life? What is it that really matters to you? Then we go through the vision process and the visioning is focused on three questions that we ask. The first one is kind of an unlimited question. Imagine that you had all the money that you need. What would you do? How would you live your life? But then we get more granular and we have what happens if you went to the doctor and you only had five to 10 years left to live. And so now it's not, the, the money is no longer unlimited, but in that situation, uh, how would you change? What would you do in the time that you have left? And then the last question is the hardest one of all, because this time you go to the doctor and you get the news that today's the day. And so now it's not, what would you do? It's what did you not get to do? Who did you not get to be? And the, the purpose of that is to help identify those things that are most important to you so that we can do some of those now. Like if I look at my life plan, because the process to become a registered life planner is experiential. The first cell on a mind ties to something that's really important to me that I can do now which is I work with women facing new beginnings. 
And that ties into a story around my mom and when I went through growing up. And so I'm in the early stages of trying to start a small scholarship so I can help women who, like my mother, went back to school later in life. And going through this process made me realize that, something I thought about a long time ago but had forgotten about. But now I can do it now and not get to the end of the life and not and not have done it. So it's really important to do those things. So that's the first part of the process for me. Then it's more the conventional planning process, as uh, Kevin discussed. But we start with that. I really start with the life planning. So investing comes after that because there's a lot of things we have to figure out before we get there. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's that's a under uh, uh, underappreciated part of the process that people don't do is is uh, is looking at the end, starting at the end, and working backwards. So I think that's that's really important. Barb, what about you? I mean, you're not you know financial advisor, but you're certainly a, a very um, knowledgeable person when it comes to planning. So you know, what do you think is missing in this? Or what do you think people should be thinking about when they're going through the planning process? I absolutely loved what Phil just said, what you echoed, and what Brian also said, which is, you know, some of us like myself are workaholics, and they believe that work is primary and trumps everything else. And obviously work is super important because you need that to form the building blocks of your financial security. And it's also very important to invest starting when you are first working to make that commitment to contributing to your 401k, knowing what's in your 401k, having a basic understanding that you want to hold a larger portion of riskier equities when you are younger, because they will give you the greatest bang for your buck, the greatest potential to compound your wealth over time. But the flip side of this, and this is something that I kind of missed out on until just recently, is to remember that we don't know when we're going to die. That is a fact. Nobody knows. And so I believe your goal is when you're on your deathbed to say, I don't have any regrets. And so that's where you set up your basic investing. If you set up your contribution to your retirement plan in your 20s and you contribute as much as you can or you add to it when you get raises, et cetera, then you have a little discretion in making sure that you're spending your time on other stuff that matters, like Phil's scholarship, like spending time with your kids, like, like keeping your relationships with your family. So money is not everything, but it is something and should be looked at as a tool to help you craft a life with no regrets yeah i, I totally agree so bill uh phil geez, i can't speak today phil <laughs> <laughs> um so in in looking at some of these processes let's 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 take some like one by one because i think some of these are really important given the where we are in the in the world economically and um you know certainly this country um where most of our listeners are but when you think about like liquidity or organizing debt Right. We're in an environment where you're actually getting paid for your cash. You know, that wasn't the case for the last 20 years. Now you're getting paid for it. And at the same time, your debt is is going up in, uh, you know, interest rates are going up across the board, in some case egregiously. So how should people think about that part of the process if they have debt or if they're, you know, if they have cash? Like, how should they be thinking about that kind of balance? So the first thing I tell people is let's start with paying yourself first a lot of people you have a workplace 401k some type of retirement plan you get a company match always contribute enough to get that match because that's really part of your compensation and if you think about it if you had to put in six percent of your salary to get a three percent match that's a 50 percent return on your money and when they decided how much they were going to pay you they took that into account they expect you to take it so you're letting the company off easy if you don't but then when we get to those other things you want to think about if you have debt, have a plan to pay it off. 
put it in place. I mean, I went through this myself. When I finished college, I had debt. I paid for part of, because I had to put myself through school. I paid for rent and I paid for tuition sometimes with credit cards. And I looked at how much an in interest I paid and I was like, oh my God, I don't make enough to pay this. So I put in place a plan to get rid of it. So I started with the highest interest rate credit card. I paid it down and then I went to the next one. And then by the eventually I got rid of all of it. It took me a little over a year to do it because I had some fortunate circumstances with work, but I put in place a plan and I made sure that that was a priority. When it comes to the, the cash that you have, you want to have that emergency fund because you have to protect against some of those things that Barb talked about originally. Something happens at your house. I mean, I had to put a new roof on this year. That's that's a big expense. And then I didn't want to have, you don't want to have to finance that, especially with rising rates. So you want to have money put aside to be able to enable you to pay for those things. You don't want to just keep it in your regular bank down the street because you're going to get like 0.01 or something less than 1%, no matter what bank you go to. That's what they're going to give you. So you can look for online banks is one opportunity, one option. You know, I have some clients that we have put treasuries of like three, six, nine, and 12 months treasuries because treasuries are paying a nice rate. That's something you can do. You can look for a money market account. You can look for an online bank. Find something. Make sure that when you have that cash, now at least we're getting paid something for it. Make sure that you get something for that cash. You get at least four, you can get four or 5% pretty easily. And also when you're thinking about debt, like here are people that have these really low mortgages, low interest rate mortgages. Don't be in a hurry to pay them off. Because right now, if you have a mortgage that's under 3%, you can earn more than that by putting the money in the bank. So unless it's just part of your psyche that you don't want to have that debt, think about the fact that don't be in a hurry because you got free money and you can earn more than whatever you're paying on that debt for the money that you have set aside. Yeah, I totally agree. So Barb, what about you? I mean, you, you've, you've, uh, you're, I shouldn't say you've, you've experienced the seventies, but certainly we all have. But you you know what the seventies <laughs> are <have>. about. <laughs> well, we don't want to call you out, but basically, you you know what the seventies are all about. So you know, I think back to like the seventies, and that was a period in time where there was a lot of hopelessness and desperation and high taxes, and you know, people were struggling across the board. And some, including myself, would say that we might be reliving that to some extent. So, how should people be thinking about you know the debt to cash balance in a period where you're a lot of people may start to struggle uh, economically. The debt to cash balance. Well, like Phil said, first of all, the 70s, for those of you who think that was like akin to the dark ages, <laughs> we had the highest level of inflation in probably 100 years. I was selling real estate in the late 70s. And I remember... I can picture this like it was yesterday. I had a client who was looking for a house and her mortgage payment was going to be 13%. Now, prices were a lot lower than they are today. But what else does that mean? That's 13% on a mortgage. Can you imagine what the credit card interest rates were? And today, we're not a approaching that, but we're having a tinge of how inflation hurts and how high interest rates hurt. And there's a psychological component to all this, because most of us here were raised in an era where everything could not be financed. And it was not the norm to finance every aspect of our lives. I don't know about you, but I get a message from my credit card or I buy something from Amazon for 25 bucks and they send me a message. Do you want to pay for this over three months? I'm like, it's $25. If I couldn't afford to buy it today and pay it off this month, I don't care what it is. I should not be buying this. Now I'm going on a rant. I have no idea what our original question was. So let me reel this back in a little and say, that is bad, okay? I'm just going to say it. Mortgage debt, fine. Student loan debt, you don't really have a choice in a lot of cases. And I agree with Phil, if you have a 3% mortgage, hang on to it. 3% student loan debt, not a problem. But the rest of this, 
you cannot build wealth if you have too much debt. It is absolutely impossible. If you are paying 20% interest payments on your credit card debt, with which you don't pay off every month, and even if you're earning 10% on average over the long haul on your stocks, you're still losing 10% um, a year. So if that doesn't motivate you to pay off your debt, then I don't know what does. So to sum it up, have a long-term perspective. Everything's, you know, nothing stays constant, but you have to have a view that in order to build wealth, you have to pay yourself first, like Phil said. You have to wrangle in that debt, whatever it costs, make the hard choices. And you have to invest, get that match from your employer and do whatever it takes to smooth out your income. Because if you spend everything you're earning today, when you get to be an old lady or man like I am, and you have no money, you're not going to be happy. I totally agree, except for the old lady part. I will not be an old lady, Barb. That that That's not, <laughs> we're not that kind of show. But um, but <laughs> we're open minded here, not to the extreme, but yes. OK, I, I can I can abide by that. OK, I appreciate you allowing me to be an old man instead of an old lady. Um, all right. So the um, so let's 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 talk about, um, you know, the like I said, the 70s were, were a tough period. And I think as we as we think about uh, this, it does kind of bring up the the question, though, because if you're if you're paying 25, 30% interest on a credit card, you're not going to be making that in the stock market. That's for sure. Not year over year. So, you know, debt is, is basically offsetting your, your investments. But then the question comes up, when should you start investing? Right? Like, you know, Brian talked about investing should be last Phil, you reiterate that. And, and Barb, I think you do too. Um, but if investing is last, when do you start investing? Because, you know, if you wait forever to pay down your debt, you may never invest. So when should that start? We talked about waiting, but that's in a planning, from a planning perspective. Overall, the earlier you start, the better, because it's not about timing the market. Like a lot of people like try to get in and out and, and do that training. It's about time in the market. The longer you're in the market, the better chance you have for growth. I mean, I, if you ever read Morgan Housel's book, Psychology and Money, he's a story about Warren Buffett. We you know he's, amassed a lot of money but part of the reason he's done it is because he started investing at a really young age and i'll tell you i had a very proud moment as a dad said i did knew i did something right one of my kids started a new job he graduated school in may and he's making a good salary and i looked in my advisor platform because he has his account under me and i saw that he funded fully his roth ira for this year he didn't even ask me he just did it and then he said dad so how much should i be putting into my 401k and he talked to me about budgeting. So investing should always be a component. But when we're looking at your financial plan and doing things over the long term, how are we going to invest? That's something we might answer later. But Barb talked too, like if you're young, you're going to take more risk. That's right. So when you're, you know, it's a simple thing, you can just get a target date fund if you want that's tied to your age. They're going to invest more aggressively than something that's not tied to your age, right? If you're young, you're going to have 90, 95% of your money in the market. You can start investing the earlier, the better. It's just when we're doing a plan, it's not going to be the thing that's front and center and doing your plan. We're going to do all the planning work before we get to how exactly how we're going to allocate your investments. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, I have to comment about target paid funds. I, I always have a problem with them because they're, they're based around a, uh, a history of the market and not market conditions or what's going on in the world like if you were going to college and you had a 529 that was target date basically and your kids are going next year you're mostly in bonds but last year that wouldn't have served you very well so I, I think you know people just need to be mindful of that um but barb what's um you know what about you when when you're when you're thinking about investing i know you were very diligent uh, about your finances as, as uh, throughout your life as well as through investing but you know you started with real estate real estate's all about debt so so how how should people think about the debt versus the the investing part when it comes to different asset classes i am one of those people that has 
always invested in debt or bonds. Okay, debt is something that we borrow, but it's also the flip side of that is if you're the lender, you're a bond owner. Okay, so I want to talk in three components. One is, yes, I invested in debt. And obviously, when I, when I was a, I'm sorry, when I started investing in real estate, obviously, I had to take out some loans. But those loans were always covered by the rental payments. I never bought a piece of real estate where I had to pay. Okay, that's the first thing. Some people are really not that smart in buying real estate and don't realize if you're not receiving income from the beginning, you're just banking on capital uh, appreciation to make your money. And that's uncertain. The only thing certain is that you're going to get rent payments for your real estate. I like real estate. It's a great investment. I believe if you had to ask me, the one thing I believe about investing is diversification. And I think it is so important for even people in their 20s and 30s. I've met so many young people who say, I can handle the declines in the stock market. I'm going to be 90, 95% invested in stocks only. You know, how do you feel when the stock market over a couple of years might drop 50%? Can you really handle that? And 2022 aside, when both the stock and bond markets decline, because this is an anomaly. It doesn't happen very often. I'm a proponent that, first of all, you want to start early. You want to start in your 20s, investing in the stock market. Put a little bit in the bond market too, in bond ETFs, intermediate term. You might get um, you know, some volatility in price, but over the long haul, your overall portfolio will be less volatile. And psychologically, for most of us, except for the most risk-tolerant people, you're going to feel a lot better when you see the stock market drop 40% and your portfolio only dropped 20% because you own some bonds in that portfolio. So to sum up my response, balance. Have a little bit in a variety of different investments. Real estate is great. I love real estate, but don't invest in real estate if you're not getting any cash flow. That makes no sense. And you got to be patient. You should not have money in the financial markets that you will need in five years. Kirk, I thought your point about the target date funds was really, really important. The money that you have for your college kids' tuition in 2025 should be in cash, cash equivalents, which means it should be in a money market fund, a CD fund, a high yield cash account. You'll get 4%. And if the stock and bond markets tank in the next two years, you're not going to be freaking out about paying that college tuition bill in two years. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I do want to, um, you know, actually kind of point this one thing out. And um, I was I was listening to somebody who I would consider a market historian, and they made a point which I didn't think about. I never bothered to look. But the fact that he made it and made me think was like, huh, no one else is thinking about this. Stocks and bonds for the last 20 years, maybe 30 years have, have been uh, in, inversely correlated. Right. One goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. Um, according to him, he said historically prior to, I guess, maybe it's the 80s, stocks and bonds actually were pretty closely correlated. So like 2022 was a more normalish kind of occurrence. Now, I'm not I have to go research this, but I just bring it up because I read it like yesterday and I was like, wow, this is fascinating. So maybe I'll make it a point on the show if, if you know, once I have a chance to do some research, but. I think the only thing you can take away from that is, as Barb said, sometimes it does happen and maybe it's rare. Maybe it'll be a commonplace in the future. We don't know, right? We only know what's happened in the past and we know that we don't know the future, but we should always prepare diversification. Totally agree with Barb. You know, diversification, if you do it right, works. Uh, but 
obviously you have to do it right and it's harder to do in this day and age um because everyone's doing the same thing but Kirk, i did want to i, I want to chime in on that issue too because yeah. um you know i'm not going to address the data of how rare it is i have just from what i have read i believe in the last 50 plus years it is unusual for yes. stocks and bonds both to decline in the same year but let's do a thought experience experiment. Let's say they do. In general, stocks are more volatile in price than bonds. So even if they do both go down in one year, it's unlikely that your bond portion of your portfolio will decline as much as the stock portion. Again, making your total decline in value in a bad year or a falling price year a little less dependent on greater losses from the stock market. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So, uh, Phil, uh, did want to touch on, on college because we talk about debt. This is a huge uh, part of uh, the start of a young adult's life is let me go into massive debt and get an education, which a lot of people would argue has a negative ROI or return on investment um, for the kids going to college. You could get your entire college education online now for free. And so spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to go party up and get a degree from an institution which uh, doesn't return the same returns, not to say it's bad. I'm just saying, if you look at the overall money spent for the return, it's not worth the money. Um, so if you, if you look at that and knowing that a lot of kids are going into massive debt, like six figure debt, uh, for kids that are going to come out and get a $30,000 a year job out of college is not a recipe for success. So how should people be thinking about debt when it comes to college and, um, and starting their life with this massive amount of debt and, and, and how that kind of plays into their, um, their evolution. So before I get to that, I just want to follow up on uh, two other things. So first, the one thing I will say on the target date funds too is you're, when I look at them, I always make sure that I know what their allocation is because sometimes the year doesn't match the person. So you want to understand how they're allocated because that diversification is important. And I, I have a story to share because Barb said, you're, you're going to start college in three years. You want to have that in cash. So I have a new client. She had come, she had bought an apartment next to hers and she wanted to combine them the time that she did it she had the money she didn't have the money though put in cash she had it in the market now she doesn't have enough money to fund the renovation she wanted to combine the two apartments and she can't because she didn't have the money in cash and the value of her mutual funds that she owned has fallen significantly and now she's trying to scramble to figure out how to fund it and that month that emergency fund that she has is still in the market and i've We've had conversations and I keep saying money that's in the mark, you know, that you need in the next five years should be in cash money market, something that you know what's there. If you've done that in the first place, you wouldn't be in this situation where you can't fund it. So it is really important. And when you're looking at the college funds, make sure that when college is getting close, that you are in cash, because at least that way, you know what you have and you don't want to see you had all this money and then the market takes it away from you as far hey, as- Phil. Yes. Out of the blue, I can't, I can't stop myself. Okay. So I apologize to everyone, but here's what she should do. She should rent out the other apartment for a couple of years and build up some cash, get some return on that investment, and then combine them later. So just my two cents. We've looked at that. The, the economics are, are not great. You're right. Like that is an alternative because that's one of the things we suggested. And I also just suggested sell the second apartment and take the cash back and not do this. Like that's another option. Um, but getting back to your question about college, I will tell you that early on when I started my firm, I talked to this one. She was very wise about what she told her daughter about college. Her daughter was choosing between two schools and one was much cheaper than the other. And her choices that she was debating for a major were either art history or English or something in the arts or, or that kind of field or accounting. And her mother told her, if you want to do 
fine arts or English, you go to the cheaper school. If you want to do accounting, we can make the we can do what we can to make the more expensive school work because I'm more comfortable that when you come out, you're going to have a job that's going to put you in position to pay for that education. So you want to try to match what you're studying to the cost that you're spending because think about what you're going to make when you finish school and what your debt is. And if you're make if what you're going to owe is multiples of what you're going to make, it's a lot harder. You're going to be in a long, it's going to be a really bad position going coming out of that because you're not going to be able to pay it off that easy. You're not going to make enough money to pay it off. And one of my early clients, they came to me and between the two of them, they had about a quarter million dollars of education, you know, debt from their education. Now she's in a job where she's working for a, a, a nonprofit. So she's under the public loan student forgiveness plan. So she's more than halfway through. So she's been paying. She didn't have to pay during the suspension of the uh, student loans that was in place, but she's on course and on track to have that debt be wiped out after 10 years because she's con she has committed to working for in that space long enough to be able to take advantage of that. So you have to think about things like that. You have to try to match. Like I got a client that they told their daughter she could go anywhere she wanted. And then when she picked a school that was $90,000 a year, they said to me, how are we going to pay for this? And like, we had all these conversations up front that you got to understand what the costs are being else. I mean, fortunately there's a grandparent that is in position to help them fund it, but otherwise it would have been really hard because that's a lot of money to come up with. So think about, I always counsel people on the idea that you go to a state school. You don't have to go to a, an expensive public institution or private institution, go to a state school. I have two of my kids went to university of Maryland where I, where I live. The cost is a lot less than if they went to an expensive school. And you know, if you're, if your child does well and they can get into a scholars program or something like that, you can go to an out of state school, but be treated as if you're an in-state resident because they will encourage, you know, they want to have good students come in. So look at that, look at the schools. There are people that work with you that will help you figure out what the cost might be based upon your financial position and your child's academic track record. What's the real cost of the school going to be? Because a lot of it times there are sticker prices and you don't pay exactly what they say, but go in knowing and do some research. Don't just tell your kids, too many parents tell their kids, go anywhere you want. It's okay. You know, you get in, we'll, we'll make it we'll make it happen. And they can't. So it's really something you got to put a lot of thought into. Think about what the potential earnings that you're going to have coming out of school. Try to match that. When we were on before, I talked, junior college is an option for some. I know I have a niece that it didn't, that did not work out well for her, but there are plenty of people that it have, but that's a way to cut your cost down substantially. If you went to a junior college for a couple of years and then went to a four-year college to get your education, or maybe college isn't for you. We need lots of carpenters. We need lots of electricians. We need lots of plumbers. Those jobs all pay a lot of money. And if you're not academically inclined, but you're good with those kind of skills, maybe that's what's better for you. So think you don't have to go to college. Think about what's best for you over the long haul. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point. And, and the, the dynamics of or the economics of it are are such that, you know, we have fewer tradesmen than we need or trades people, if you want to be politically correct, which we're never on the show. But if we're if we have the trades, we need more tradespeople, right? In in economic boom times, you never have enough. In bus times, we have too many, right? It's just the way the nature of things. So I think that can be challenging, but there's always a need for tradespeople. And people aren't going to trade schools, right? They they're going to college and they're getting a degree in American studies and then they come out with you know, two two hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars of debt, and they're like, "Oh, I got to get a job," or they get a degree in philosophy and be like, "Oh, that was fun." And now, what do I do? And which, by the way, philosophy is actually a great degree if you if you utilize it because people know that you know how to think. So some employers actually appreciate that. But generally speaking, a lot of people go to college. You're like, "Hey, this is fun." Now, I went to Trinity College, which I think was like the third most expensive college at the time uh behind duke and yale and uh i think they were more but it was an expensive school and it was before i left a month before i left I, I was talking to somebody and they said you know what the best part about college is is the people you meet so don't worry about the grades don't worry about that because it only matters if you're getting you know an additional degree like a graduate school or you're going into a, a profession that requires um 
you know, really good grades, right? But otherwise, you're you're learning what you want to learn, you're meeting the people you want to meet. And, and the best thing about it is the people you meet. And that was 100% true for me. Like the people I met were, were the, the, the benefit of the school. Now beyond that, could I have, could I have been the same without going to college? Sure. I probably could, but that's not for everybody. I think some people, everybody's different and different people need different things. But I think we should be very thoughtful as, as Phil says about state schools, like should be very thoughtful about that, right? There are plenty of great state schools. You know, you don't always have to go to a private school. Everyone wants the best for their kids, but you know, if it's going to destroy your retirement at the same time, is it the best thing for everybody? It's, you know, it's an open question. And so we're going to get, uh, we have a resident college expert, uh, Jack, and also Doug, who's on the show all the time. And, you know, we'll get them on the show to talk a little bit about the college experience, because I think the the economics of it are, are such that you really need an expert to work with you. Um, I mean, I think about the complexity, it's a confusopoly. Uh, as as tech it's actually that's a technical word now it's not such something i made up um where confusopoly is, a, is an industry that is deliberately confusing so that it hides the uh the the nature of the uh, product being a commodity think insurance think colleges think the medical systems they're all commodities and they're confusopolies which make it confusing for you to tell one from the other and so you end up overpaying because you can't you, you can't discern what's true and what isn't. Um, so unfortunately, that's the case with college and you really need somebody to, to help you. So Barb, I want to talk to you and then we're going to get close to wrapping it up here. So what are your thoughts about college nowadays? I mean, your your kids are through college. You don't have to worry about it. You can kick colleges to the curb. But what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Because it's changed a lot in the last you know 40 years. You guys really covered it. I mean, you really did. There's a lot of options there. You have to... I, I really don't have anything to add. Consider your own situation, consider your family situation, and don't do something because you think you should. You know, don't go to this, you know, I've got to go to a private school because it's more prestigious. You can have a superb life wherever you go to college or if you don't go to college. My husband's college roommate, and he, my husband went to a small liberal arts school. Um, not well known at all. His college roommate went on to get an MBA at Chicago, University of Chicago, and became the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. There are people that went to Harvard that are doing nothing. There are people that went to a state school that are president of the United States. That's all I got to say. Okay. All right. Mic drop on, on Barb there. Great. Thanks, Barb. Um, all right. So uh, I guess we'll wrap it up here, Phil. Final thoughts from you and where can people find more about you? So when it comes to your financial decisions, be considerate. Think, Don't just make rash decisions. Think about the implications of what you're doing. That applies to college. That applies to saving. It applies to spending too. As far as where to find me, I know that experiencing big life transitions can be stressful. My job is to help empower women facing new beginnings with the financial knowledge and tools they need to, they need to make self-assured decisions. My firm is Apprise Wealth Management. You can download my free ebook at apprisewealth.com slash ebook. And you can also sign up for my blog there. Thanks for having me today, Kurt. Great. Thanks for coming on, Phil, and sharing your wisdom. Barb, uh, final thoughts from you. And where can people find more about you? Educate yourself. It's not that hard. Even if you don't like numbers, investing, or any of the stuff we're talking about now, you can get a basic investment, finance, money management, personal finance information online from credible sources at Investopedia, at your investment brokerage account, Vanguard, Schwab, Fidelity, wherever. They all have superb educational articles that are easy to consume. I'm not here to make any money off of you. My name is Barbara Friedberg. You can find me on my website at Barbara Friedberg Personal Finance. I also write all across the internet on a variety of investing topics. Thanks for having me on. I will see you next time.
Great. Well, thanks for coming on, Barb, and thanks for volunteering for being our color coordinator and beautification agent, uh, which I need quite a bit of. So thank you for color coordinating. We're all wearing the same color today. So kudos to you. That's the show for this week. Thank you again for joining us on Money Tree Investing Podcast. My name is Kirk Chisholm, Wealth Manager of Innovative Advisor Group. We don't just manage your wealth, we make your life better. You can find more about me at innovativewealth.com. And of course, you can find me every week here on this show. You can also check out our show at Money Tree Investing Podcast. On our website, you'll have access to the show notes, resources, and the archive shows. Please remember to subscribe on our YouTube channel for immediate access to the new shows when they're released. When you subscribe to the show, it allows us to get access to some of the top minds of investing in personal finance. While you're here, please leave a comment and question if you want us to address it on the show. Have a great week ahead. And remember, no one will care about your money like you do. So invest in your life.